welcome to another exciting edition of the ESP Practical Lawyer Pro Webinar Series. My name is Jessica Ikenedu, I'm the moderator for today's webinar. At ESP Training Limited, we provide comprehensive, continuous professional learning with courses and training across various areas of practices. We have started this webinar series to launch our webinar series that is slated to hold by 1 p.m. during lunch break every Tuesdays and Thursday, respectively. After every section, we provide resources in easy accessible format on Eagle for everyone who is interested. And today's topic is understanding net neutrality. Net neutrality is a principle that internet service providers should not restrict, modify, or obstruct data flowing across their networks. And some of the things that will be discussed today is history of net neutrality, network transparency, measures to protect customers, information accessibility, case study and pending losses in net neutrality, the future of net neutrality. If you have any question why the webinar and any due time to be answered, it is with great delight I introduce our speakers for today. And our very first speaker for today is Chika Oke, who is a senior associate at DOA and she'll be speaking on history of net neutrality and network transparency. We also have Mr. Solomon, who is a partner at Solomon Okedara and Co. And he will be talking on measures to protect customer information accessibility. And we also have Ms. Simi, who is a partner at OAS Law. And she'll be talking on future of net neutrality, case study, and pending lawsuits in net neutrality. So over to you, Chika. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thank yeah. you, Jessica. My name is Chika Oke, like Jessica rightly said. I'm a senior associate at the law firm of Duali, Ovia, and Alexa Dedica, DOA Law. We are a corporate law firm in Lagos and Abuja. Um, so today, my co-panelists and I will be giving an overview on net neutrality, and I'll start off by discussing the history of net neutrality and also shed some light on the principle of net, network transparency and its operations in Nigeria. Um, Jessica, could you please um, give me permission to share my screen and I'll just do that right away. Yes, you can. Thanks so much. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Okay, so we'll start off with um, the history of net neutrality. So what is network neutrality? Network neutrality, commonly known as net neutrality in principle, refers to the equal non-discriminatory access to the internet by all and sundry. It is the principle that internet service providers, ISPs, must remain neutral and impartial when providing internet access. It must treat all internet communication equally and not intentionally block, throttle, discriminate, prioritize, or indiscriminately charge for access to specific online content, applications, or websites. So for example, an ISP cannot block, slow down, or alter access to service A to, or make it faster and easier to access service B. Now, um, net neutrality was a term coined in 2002 by Columbia University media law professor Timu. At the time, some broadband providers in the US, such as Comcast, banned home internet users from accessing virtual private networks, also known as VPNs, while other networks, other uh, key industry players like AT&T also banned users from using Wi-Fi routers. In his paper written in 2003, Tim Wu was worried that these broadband providers' tendencies to restrict new technologies would hurt and stifle innovation in the long run, and called for an anti-discrimination rule that would ensure a level playing field amongst internet users. I know that um, uh, one of the panelists will also be diving into case law, but just to touch and give more flesh to what I've been saying, another major case in the US was in 2014 between Netflix and Comcast, where it was noticed that Comcast had intentionally slowed down the streaming services of Netflix because it believed that Netflix in rendering its services to consumers utilized very high bandwidth and as such was to be obligated to pay for use and upgrade of the infrastructure. Now Comcast is 
um, an ISP in Nigeria, ISPs could be your SpectraNet, your CobraNet, your TZTs of the world. So moving on to the question, why does net neutrality matter? Net neutrality matters because it has the potential to shape the future of the internet and with it, our access to knowledge. Without net neutrality regulations, the internet could become a throttled, restricted and tightly controlled landscape where both consumers and content providers exist to enrich these ISPs. So who does net neutrality affect? Net neutrality affects everyone from internet users, content providers and internet service providers and it does so in different ways. It begs the question, when is net neutrality happening? Is this, is this a past time phenomenon? Is this something currently ongoing? Net neutrality has been an issue since the earliest days of the internet and remains the subject of current discussion until today. In the US, the FCC, which is the Federal Communications Commission, issued an open internet order in 2010 that has been the major sticking point in the past several years. So moving on to the, um, moving on, we'll discuss the advantages and disadvantages of net neutrality. The global debate on net neutrality has been far reaching with divergent views. Some of the arguments which have been canvassed both for and against the adoption of implementation of the implementation of net neutrality will be discussed as we moved on. So some proponents of net neutrality include human rights organizations, consumer rights advocates, and software companies who believe that open internet is critical for the democratic exchange of advice and free speech, fair business competition, and technological innovation. They often argue that cable companies, for instance, should be classified as common carriers, like public utility companies or public transportation providers who are forbidden by law from discriminating among, amongst their users. Other advocates for network neutrality suggest that by not allowing ISPs to determine the speed at which consumers can access specific websites or services, smaller companies will more likely, more likely be able to enter the markets and create new services. This is largely because smaller companies may not be able to afford to pay for fast lane services or access, while larger, more established companies can. Advocates also view net neutrality as a cornerstone of an open-minded internet and propose that it be mandated by law in the US to prevent broadband providers from practicing data discrimination as a competitive tactic. For example, several well-established social networks were created without much seed capital. Had they been forced to pay extra to be accessed at the same speed as competitors, they may never have been successful. So it's like the Facebooks of the world. Facebook started from Mark Zuckerberg's college dorm room. If net neutrality was not in place at the time, there would be no Facebook today. Certain advocates also um, highly push the agenda of a dumb pipe. What a dumb pipe simply means is that intelligence should only be located at the end of a network known as the pipe, while the the conduit itself should remain neutral. This is the dumb aspect of it. Advocates of net neutrality see municipal broadband as, as a possible solution to these problems. Without net neutrality today, regulations, regulators, proponents argue that there'll be nothing to stop ISPs and cellular providers from limiting traffic from competitors, imposing even like an a la carte pricing for access to fast lanes or forcing certain companies like online streaming services so like the netflix of the world the hulus of the world etc to pay more for bandwidth apologies my screen is just frozen i'm just trying to switch to the next slide Can everyone see my screen, please? Yes, I can. Perfect, great. Okay, so like I was saying, uh, moving on to the disadvantages of net network neutrality, some openness of network neutrality 
include conservatives like think tanks, hardware companies, and major telco providers across the world. They suggest that by forcing ISPs to treat all traffic equally, the government will ultimately discourage the, the investment in new infrastructure and will also create a incentive for ISPs to innovate. So, so let's look at it this way, right? The, the upfront cost associated with laying down fiber optic wires come at a cost. And these um, opponents of net neutrality look at these costs as very expensive. I sometimes argue that them not even being able to charge more for that level of access will make their investments more difficult to pay off. Another possible disadvantage of net neutrality could be that the providers also argue that they may be allowed to charge tiered prices for access to remain competitive and generate funds needed for further innovation and expansion of broadband networks, as well as to recoup the costs already invested in broadband. They are largely of the opinion that this disallowance stifles growth and heavily discourages ISPs. So if you can see my screen, it's just a global map of the world showing the status of net neutrality across the world. The areas highlighted in light blue are territories where the net neutrality provisions are in place and protect, protecting their jurisdictions. The areas in red are jurisdictions also constituting these protections. The areas in gray are areas where um, net neutrality has not been enforced. There's no protectionary measure against this. Right, so net neutrality across the globe, we will be looking at, I've just picked a few company, uh, a few countries, my mistake, I've just picked a few countries that I found quite interesting during my research. Some of them have adopted net neutrality to an extent, while some haven't, some are in the process. So we'll start with the US, for instance. So in the US, the FCC, like I mentioned earlier, which is the Federal Communications Commission, actually instituted an open internet order However, sometime in 2015, we saw that this order was rolled back by the FCC. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so like I was so saying, in the US, given the importance of the internet to our everyday lives and socioeconomic impact, the decision of the FCC has been subject to global discussion and critique. So ever since the rollback, the term has been the center of debate over internet regulation. The Congress, the FCC, and the courts in the US have all debated on whether and whether this is necessary and how to protect network, network neutrality. Critics see this decision as a threat to internet consumer freedoms, economic competition, and even the progress of scientific research and knowledge discovery. I mean, I, I think that um, for one, we can also agree, seeing how important the internet is to the advance, advancement of innovation, the development of human capital and even economic growth is very imperative for technologists, researchers, and innovators alike to take heed of the policy debates and these latest developments as it impacts our lives in various ways. It would also be uh, having a look at what's applicable in the EU. In the EU, so in the EU sometime in 2019, net neutrality was presented to the EU parliament and it was well adopted and received. Under the EU rules, ISPs are prohibited from blocking or slowing down internet traffic except when necessary. So these exceptions are limited to traffic management and um, to comply with legal orders or to ensure network integrity and security, and also to manage exceptional or temporary network congestions that may arise due to heavy traffic. So the provisions enshrined in EU laws are very end user friendly and it confers the right to free access and distribution of information and content. Specific provisions in these laws also ensure that national authority, authorities can enforce these rights. 
So we also touched on um, Russia and Australia. Um, you would think that with Russia, with all the heavy censorship that goes on in Russia, Russia will be heavily against net neutrality. But we actually saw that sometime in 2016, Russia passed its net neutrality laws. In net, in, so I mean, I think people will look at it this way, like a neutral approach doesn't mean that data is permissible. It just means that the government has um, the right to block access to a large number of sites. Another uh, jurisdiction I wanted to touch base on was Australia. Now, Australia, very far off, people often joke and say that Australia is a world of its own, but Australia currently has no net neutrality laws, and it seems very unlikely to change anytime soon. ISPs in the company in the country is regulated by the Australian Communications and Media Authority across the country. ISPs regularly offer zero rated content through partnerships with content providers. So um, just to shed more light for people that don't know, zero rated content here means data from specific apps or websites that aren't counted towards the user's monthly data limits. So it allows providers to forge partnerships with particular apps and websites, any of their choosing. So moving on to Nigeria, um, like we're all aware, the NCC is highly in support of net neutrality and Sometime in 2017, they released a draft Internet Industry Code of Practice, also known as the Draft Code, that are, allows ISPs to comply with global net neutrality policies. It's also important to mention that um, it's merely a draft code and hasn't been passed into law just yet. Now, this brings me to the second half of my discussion today, the ongoing debate on net neutrality versus net transparency. Some often say that net neutrality and net transparency are one and the same thing. One cannot happen without the other. While a different school of thought thinks that, you know what, net neutrality is a standalone, while net transparency is a standalone, and net neutrality is not achievable, while net transparency should be the other of the day. So like I mentioned earlier in Nigeria, the NCC's position is quite obvious and recognizes that an open internet is key to innovation. It also acknowledges that other factors must be taken into consideration, including online child protection, for instance, privacy and data protection, objectionable consent, unsolicited communication, traffic management practices, ETC, these are all considered necessary in order to maintain network efficiency. So questions with powers under the NCA, which is the Nigerian Communication Act, the NCC has published the guidelines for the provision of internet services, which applies to all, I, all ISPs across the nation. The guidelines require all ISPs to comply with the Consumer Code of Practice Regulations, which provides a template for the minimum terms and conditions for the provision of telcos and consumer practices in Nigeria. So like I mentioned earlier, the NCC also released the draft code in line with um, the upholding of net neutrality principles. The draft code acknowledges and provides for the consumer's right to an open internet and further guarantees the right to have unrestricted and non-discriminatory access to lawful contents. So in accordance with this provision, the end user basically is free to send and receive information and content online and use the appropriate terminal device of his or her choice without restriction from any ISP. So under the draft code, the ISPs are heavily mandated to be completely transparent by providing full and accurate technical and commercial information on their services and to make a full and fair disclosure of information regarding bandwidth. This is including whether the bandwidth is shared or dedicated to the user. So other sections of the draft code also seek to impose specific transparency obligations on the ISPs with respect to the performance, technical and commercial terms of the internet access service in a manner that is sufficient for consumers and third parties to make informed choices regarding their use of such services. So from, from all of this, we see that the NCC is heavily pro net neutrality.
So just to sum it up and um, bring me to a conclusion, the aim of net neutrality and net transparency is basically to balance the interest between ISPs and internet content providers by enforcing protections against content and application discrimination. It's, it's quite evident that the NCC has done a thorough work as the neutrality provisions of the draft code are consistent with the global standard for net neutrality, which have been adopted in other jurisdictions. However, like I mentioned earlier, the draft code is yet to be is yet to be passed into law and obviously cannot be implemented at this time. I'd also like to um, just bring to your attention that as is the norm in other jurisdictions, the rights of the service providers to adopt reasonable traffic management practices is also recognized and provided for in Nigeria. So this balance is highly, highly important to maintain and protect the reliability and optimal performance of network providers in Nigeria. So with this, it brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope we've all been able to learn a thing or two about the history of net neutrality and transparency. Thank you. Thank you so much for such an insightful presentation. So our next speaker will be Mr. Suluma. We'll be speaking on measures to protect customer information and accessibility. Over to you, Mr. Suluma. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you so much, Jessica. It's a pleasure to be with everyone this afternoon. Yeah, so um, I think first of all, I actually um, did something rather more expansive, um, which um, covers a very a whole gamut of, um, of um, net neutrality. But be that as me, I realized that I'm actually limited to um, the application of privacy and data protection principle as it concerns net, net neutrality. Now, so uh, the very first thing I need to also understand that now generally because, you know, internet service providers during the course of um, doing their work, you know, carrying out, you know, their, their, their duties. Now they go, out of the, they, they go out of their way to ensure that they deploy technologies that will actually make their work easier. For example, uh, we have come across the use of a technology known as deep packet inspection. Now that's, that technology allows them to um, examine data traveling over the internet. Now, but why doing that? Now the use or the deployment of that technology becomes so intrusive that it actually gathers personal data of internet users. Now, and when we look at it, now, the, the concept of laws that govern neutrality all over the world is to the extent that users' personal data and information must be protected. Now, and that's it. So, because when we look at it, while the internet service providers are actually doing their work, gathering their information, now their technology gets to be intrusive that it actually gathers information beyond what they need which are personal data and information of users. Then what do we do? Then in that situation, we resort to the need to comprehensively protect personal data of internet users. Now, and in doing that, it has actually been established that the only way that can be done is to have an, a, a comprehensive data protection legislation. Now, as we all know in Nigeria today, we don't have a comprehensive data protection legislation. A sub, a, what we have at best, which is the uh, Nigeria Data Protection Regulation, NDPR 2019, is at best a subsidiary legislation which is fraught with many inadequacies. So during the course of this conversation, now I, I will actually take us through the, the nitty gritty of what have to be put in place for us to ensure that Personal data of users are actually protected. In fact, comprehensively protected when we enjoy the, the, the use of the internet. Now, so the very first thing is this. Now, we need to ensure that there is a comprehensive data protection legislation. Um, I, I, I need to make a reference to, um, to data protection bill 2020 that many Nigerians today uh, we consider as the legislative, legislative offer to govern the concept of data protection and privacy in Nigeria. And there's a very dangerous provision in that bill. Now, I, I will take us to provision of um, section 35 of that bill. 
Um, let me be quick to say that uh, my slide will be made available within the next 24 hours after this, um, this meeting. And of course, which will be so detailed to cover everything that is gonna be discussed here. Now, so the first thing is that provision of section 35 of that bill states that the principle of privacy, data privacy shall be exempted when some issues you know, come up. What are the issues? Issues of national security, public defense, public morality, public health, and all of that. Now, the challenge with that is this. Now, a, a, an internet service provider can just for whatever reason, just address an issue of um, national security, particularly all they need to do is to cite such national security by, by whatever means that, okay, because of that, they need to deploy uh, a particular technology. For example, like I cited, the issue of the deep packet inspection in, on, on, on their platform. And when they do that, the, 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 the likelihood is that people's personal or users' personal data you know, become uh, a, a matter of risk. And when that happens, they know that they have a ready defense, which is an issue of national security. But we have come to a point that in, in, in violation or possible violations of people's personal data on digital platform, now it is not automatic to just cite national security. Now, whether that is being deployed by, um, by the government itself or through the ISP, now the provisions of the law have to be complied with. Even though as of today, we do not have a comprehensive data protection legislation like we all know, but we all know that provisions of section 45 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999 is very clear on the fact that when issues of privacy among other rights is to be threatened or violated, some things have to be established. The first thing is that that can only be done by a law. Now, so the question we need to ask ourselves today is what constitutes a law? What constitutes a, a law has actually been defined in a number of cases that it has to be an act of the legislature. So I, I, I'm gonna share with you, there's a particular case, which is um, a judgment of the Court of Appeal of Lagos State, uh, or sitting in Lagos State. Now, um, that is the case of Abdul Karim versus Lagos State government. In that case, the court held that a directive of a governor shall not qualify under any circumstance, shall not qualify as a law because it is not an act of the legislature. So what we are saying here is that if for any reason, whether the government by itself or through an ISP or any of its agency would deploy a technology that has a capacity to, to compromise users' privacy and data. Now, doing that has to be by a law. Now, yes, of course, I need to be clear here that the law we are talking about here sometimes may not come in the form of an act, may not come in the form of, um, of a law by House of Assembly, but even if it is by a, 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 a regulation, yes, made possible or issued possible to, um, to uh, a valid and existing act, an extant act or extant law, then it shall be interpreted to be a body law. So the first thing we need to be sure is that while uh, whatever agency or data controller, whether it is the ISP this time or an agency of the government like, um, like NCC, now is, is, is actually taking a position for whatever reason, we need to be sure that first, it has to be relied, a law has to be relied upon in doing that. Now, some of us can remember, uh, I think during the NSAT protests in 2020, some websites were reportedly blocked on the instruction of the agency of the federal government. Now, the, doing that cannot just be by direct of any minister or a DG of an agency. It has to be, in fact, if, when that, uh, that decision is being communicated to ISP, they have to rely on a position 
or a provision of an extant legislation. That's number one. Number two, the second thing that has to be observed is that it must be in pursuance of a constitutional objective. Now, if we look at the provision of section 45 of the 1999 constitution, it is clear to the extent that when you need, yes, privacy, for example, and uh, you know, privacy expression and some other right from section 37 to section 41 of the constitution, they are not absolute. But then the position of the law is that they can only be restricted in strict adherence to constitutional provisions. And one of such provisions is that one, like I stated, they can only be restricted by an extant legislation. Now, number two, uh, even during the concept of the extant legislation, the provision of that law has to be precise, clear, and must be devoid of any ambiguity. What that means is that in any situation, the citizens must not be left in doubt as to what website they can visit, what activity they can conduct online that can actually constitute a violation of the law, that can actually expose their personal data to compromise. So the, the, a, a citizen, a user, needs to be notified by provision of the law ahead of time. Now, I must not be in doubt as to what act or omission on digital platform will constitute an offense or not. Now, so number two, now it, it, it must be such a restriction must be in pursuance or in, in, in protection of a constitutional objective. Like I said earlier, the ready defense for the government is always national security. Now, sometimes public health, sometimes public safety, um, um, the, 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 the government big up public safety, public health, and all of that. Now, if we could remember during the uh, during COVID, now a, a good number of um, jurisdictions around the world lawsuits were filed to enforce people's rights. Now, while doing that, most of the government all around the world actually cited public health as their defense in violating people's rights, including the right to assembly, you know, even on digital platforms. Now, so in, in, the, in that situation, the position of the law is that such a restriction that would violate users' personal data on digital platform has to be in portions of a public objective. Let me give an example, which um, uh, I, I need us to be able to relate to this. Now, the position of the of our court has been that one, the data controller or uh, whatever institution is responsible for restricting or violating personal data on digital platform now cannot just be a blanket position of citing a, a, a position in the position. For example, national security. It cannot be blanket. Now, you need to uh, put before the court a sufficient position to justify an imminent threat to national security. Now, one of such is if, for example, operation of a particular website now is likely to expose the national security of, of, of the nation to a whole lot of danger or threat. Now, so you need to, the, the government or whoever is responsible need to put before the court that these are the imminent threat to national security. Now, the top one is that the restriction must not be excessive or out of proportion. Now, one of such, uh, as such have been interpreted. Now, the, there's a particular case, um, GKOB and DPP. The court held that the court shall not be a rubber stamp of the act of legislature or executive, but shall determine, shall be the impartial arbiter to determine what is reasonably justifiable. Now, so, because when we look at that section 45, section 45 says such a restriction shall be what is reasonably justifiable in a democratic society. Now, let's say, for example, 
Now, the federal government set up a website, and the website allows, or a portal, the portal allows the government to be able to address people's personal data. And in such institution, there's no privacy policy, no provision of data protection officer. There, of course, people's personal data are now exposed, you know, to compromise or, or in an unchecked manner. Now, I'm going to give an example to that. Now, so sometime in 2020, now we discovered at Digital Lawyers Initiative that there's a particular portal of federal government that where people can apply for a particular fund. I think the federal government of Nigeria set up a fund of about 75 billion naira to actually aid Nigerian youth in the in entrepreneurship. Now, but we discovered that one, the website did not have a privacy policy. Two, the website does not actually have a data protection officer. Now, I, 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 amongst all the provisions of the Nigeria data protection regulation itself. Now, so at the end of the day, now we went to court and we actually submitted before the court that one, failure to provide privacy policy that will stipulate how the user's personal data will be processed is actually an invitation to violation of people's personal data. Number two, even when my personal data is actually compromised, the law provides that there should be a data protection officer of the data controller, which is the platform now, the, the, the agency running the platform that I can actually complain to. Now we discovered that such also did not exist. And we went to court. Now, at the end of the day, the federal court city in my judgment in that case and agreed with us absolutely. In fact, the court opened all of our 12 reliefs. Now, only that failure to provide a privacy policy on the portal, it's a violation of the extant regulation, which is the Nigeria Data Protection Regulation 2019, and two, non-provision of data protection officer and details of an officer Hello everyone, I think Mr. Solomon is having some internet issues, so let's wait for him to join us shortly. Thank you so much. Hello, Mr. Solomon. Please, can anyone hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome back. Hello? Hello. Hello, Jessica, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can hear you. Okay. 
Là. Hello, Mr. Solomon. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. So, yeah, thank, thank you. So, um, if you can hear me, so let me just um, uh, wind up here. Um, can you hear me, Jessica? Yes, I can. Hello. I can hear you, Mr. Solomon. I can hear you. I can hear you. Can you hear me? So can I go ahead, please? Oh my goodness, the, the internet is... Um, I, I hope we are not victims of uh, net discrimination. <laughs> I hope so. Can you hear me, Jessica? Yes, I can hear you, but the internet is not just very but I understand why. But I can hear you. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. I think I will need to call Mr. Solomon to find out the possible solution to this. So I'll be, I'll call him shortly right now. So then if he cannot join us due to the internet, Mrs. Simi can start our presentation. Sorry about that. Hello, Jessica, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Welcome back, Mr. Solomon. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, even though the, like I said earlier, I said, I hope we are not a um, victim of um, net discrimination. You know, it's actually, um, sometimes uh, we live in a very volatile environment and things happen. So, Yes, so I, I think I should just uh, wrap it up here. Um, now, the Internet Code of Practice, um, well, it's actually issued uh, by NCC itself. Now, it, it makes um, two remarkable provisions on the concept of breach notification. So, and this is it. Now, um, the truth is that even the perfect, or uh, there's no perfect system anywhere in the world, you know, for um, for data storage, you know, or uh, and protection of personal data. Now there are always cases of data breach in Europe, in America, and 
all, all, all over the world. Now, so, but the point is this. Now, the, uh, the NCC has said that, look, in any situation, when there is an incident of data breach of an internet user, now, as an internet service provider, you have a duty, a duty within the law to notify the user within 48 hours. Now, and of course, uh, beyond that, the, that ISP also has a duty within the law. Now, of course, under the court to notify the commission. Now, that is the, uh, that is the NCC under 48 hours also now on the issue of uh, the incident of such breach. Now, I, I will tell you the instance of the, the, the importance or the relevance of that. Now, the truth is this. Now, the moment there's such a breach, the, because this, because right to personal data, it's a right. So the user who is the data subject now, he has a right within the law to be aware that there has been an issue of breach to his personal data. So he has a right within the law to be aware. Now, what that does to him is that if there is actually a need to foster um, further breach or further unauthorized access to his personal data, maybe on other digital platforms, then it can immediately take an action to prevent such. Now, and of course, the commission, which is the SEC also at this, in this situation, has a duty under the law to oversee such a situation, including remedies that actually have to be put in place. So, uh, and this actually takes us to the place of responsibility on the part of internet service providers. So, so far so good. Well, I think the internet uh, code of practice actually appears very ambitious, but then, we know the problem we have always had in our society is not actually want of legislation, but effective implementation of legislation. So we believe even strongly that the, the, the excellent legislation we have, if they are actually given expansive and purposive application, then uh, all, all the rights of an internet user, including right to personal data, will be you know, sufficiently and compulsively protected. I think uh, at this point, I will want to um, audit it and uh, allow um, the third uh, speaker to actually take over. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you, everyone. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Sonu, for insightful insight. We will sorry about that. Uh, net neutrality case study and your please do type in the q and &E and after our presentation we'll be taking the questions thank you so much over to you mrs Singh. thank you so much thank you so much um jessica uh okay can you share my screen please yes you can okay perfect good afternoon everyone my name is simi salau uh, i'm from oas law it's a commercial law firm in Lagos. So this afternoon, I'll briefly go over case laws and um, studies in net neutrality and what the future of net neutrality holds. Okay, so the first one um, case that I'm going to talk about was um, the National Cable and Telecommunications Association um, versus Brand X Internet Services. Just one second, please. Um, Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, 
Okay, I think everyone's frozen. Can you hear me? Okay, okay, perfect. Because I can't, Jessica seems to be frozen. Perfect. Okay, so um, this case, we had the situation where the Federal um, Communications Commission in the US. So this was the first case in 2002 uh, that started this whole debate about um, net neutrality in the US. So this case was about a company um, that's um, Brand X Internet who was suing um, the National Cable Telecommunications um, Association because um, they refused to um, allow so the National Cable and Telecommunications Association so this came to the Supreme Court. So this one I'm talking about was in the Supreme Court. But it started in the lower courts where they came to sue saying that companies like AT&T were charging them for them to be able to use their landlines. So AT&T are companies that um, have cable lines in the US. And um, so they also tend to have their own um, internet service that they provide to their customers as well in the US. And then you have the private ISPs, that's internet service providers, like Brand X, who also provide um, internet services. So what they usually do is they try to leverage, connect through their cable to be able to give um, internet to others through the telephone line. So because AT&T is an established um, company, they were trying to use their cable then. And AT&T would extort them by charging them as much as twice the cost of what it would um, what it would usually charge so which meant that this um, private companies their own internet prices had to spike definitely to their customers as well and when you have AT&T giving you 50% of what this other company is obviously consumers are going to go to AT&T instead right so now this is when they came and so they went to court to sue the companies that this is net neutrality and they need to make it fair and um, in discriminating for everyone, they should not discriminate um, the both the ISPs and users from using the internet. So now um, the FCC. So the thing about um, net neutrality in the US is it's been quite a back and forth, um, should I say, debate between the court, federal court, and states and ISPs and consumers as well. So now you have the um, FCC, so that's the Federal Communications Commission. They tend to, depending on the political um, party in power, it tends to change. So during Trump's era, the FCC was against net neutrality. During Obama's era, it was pro-net neutrality. So you will see, so this case, like I said, started everything. So as we go along, so um, this case had the court telling us that, yes, the FCC can classify Internet service providers um, as either information service or telecommunication service or what we call um, communication carriers, common carriers rather. So the difference between these two information service and telecommunication service is that if you're an information service, the FCC cannot regulate you. You have to be a telecommunications provider or the classified as telecommunication service for the FCC to be able to regulate the um, company or the ISP. So we have the situation where um, now this um, ATT and Co. we're now saying that no, they cannot be branded as telecommunication service providers, but instead as information service. In that way, FCC would not be able to control them. So this is how all the whole debate kept going back and forth. And like I said, depending on who is in power, it changes. Um, so in 2010, the government then decided, OK, we're going to implement the open Internet order, which was created for net neutrality. In this, we have the case of Verison Communication and the FCC, where it was ruled that the FCC had little power to regulate ISPs as far as they were classified as information services. Now, this open internet order was meant to make um, the internet transparent to avoid traffic, throttling, and um, 
price um, privatization. And so, again, like I said, in 2010, as far as um, FCC kept classifying the internet providers, ISPs, as information services, they can't do anything. So this then led to 2015 when Obama was in, then this open internet order um, went to IED and the FCC then classified ISPs as common carriers, now giving them the legal power to enact um, net neutrality protections, which were preventing ISPs from blocking or throttling legal websites, or from extorting all that private ISPs or asking them to pay for fees. We then move on to 2017, 2016, 2017, when um, Trump comes in. Again, we see that the FCC recall, they actually reversed their earlier order, that's the open internet order. They reversed it and said, no, they're changing this um, ISPs back to internet service, meaning the FCC do not have any authority whatsoever over the transparency or the practices of ISPs. So now we have this uh, Mozilla, that's, um, I don't know how many of us then used to use Firefox. Mozilla was the one that owned Firefox. So they then sued the FCC because they were being charged as well. And as you can see now, Firefox doesn't really exist. It's not as strongly, you don't see Firefox like you used to then. And this is because due to the fact that um, so many internet providers do not, they basically slow the traffic and you can't really see them as um, a search engine. So they then sued them. And the court again had to rule that FCC cannot really do anything about it because they have classified ISPs as um, information services rather than common carriers. So we then go on to more recently in California. So due to the fact that FCC cannot do anything, you then have some states that have said, you know what, we are going to establish our own state laws to allow um, ISPs to um, allow net neutrality in our state and to be able to control the ISPs and um, net neutrality. So we have California. I think California and Vermont were one of the um, states that did so. So California in 2018 decided to pass this law and the FCC then came and they tried to sue them through the um, Department of Justice on the Trump's era. They came and they decided to sue the, uh, um, the California state. And they, so what they argued then was that since <clears throat> the FCC doesn't have any um, right to um, authorize or to um, enact any laws or to prevent um, the ISPs from doing what they want, then California cannot go ahead to then implement their own laws as the FCC trumps because the federal law, it trumps the state. So this went back and forth until earlier on this year when Joe Biden comes in and Joe is pro, like I said, depending on the party, um, Joe Biden is pro. And so he allows um, the, so he drops the suit totally. He actually dropped the suit. And so now California is going to enact their own net neutrality laws. So, uh, so no, so that means FCC as well. We no longer have any authority again, because they are, they've still not changed the, um, their authority over ISPs, but California will be able to rule their own net neutrality laws and make policies for that. Uh, then we have the Netflix case, which is another very interesting one. Netflix, uh, I'm sure most of us watch, I don't know how many most of us watched, um, All of Us Are Dead. And uh, what's this other one? Um, uh, Squid Game, yes. So those are very popular Korean shows that were very popular over the COVID period. and. Obviously, due to the number of traffic that came on to Netflix, a lot of um, internet pro um, ISPs were like, no, Netflix needs to be sharing their, uh, they need to be paying them to be able to use their services because all the bandwidth that is going from the users using Netflix and Netflix is getting richer and all these people are using their um, internet service and they are not really getting any benefit from it. So we have Korea in 2020 who actually, um, so they implemented this Telecommunications Business Act, which forced foreign companies, foreign content providers to pay for network usage fees to local Netflix, um, to, um, to Netflix, basically, 
so, so so that means companies like Netflix had then to pay them for the services. So now Sorry about that. Okay. So now we have um so Netflix then sues the Korean um, company, that's um, SK Broadband, and tells them that since their consumers pay for their network usage, they should not be liable to any fees at all for using their um, network. The same thing happened in um, Netflix and Comcast too. Comcast was requesting for money from Netflix um, in 2014. And what they did was um, Netflix alleged that what Comcast was doing over their own network was that they were slowing down Netflix streaming service to their own consumers, which was causing problems for them. And so they wanted a, a Netflix to also pay them. So the thing about this is if there are net neutrality laws, we'll see that all of this um, pay me for using my service and whatnot would not happen. But all these companies, um, all these rather um, countries, because and um, companies, they are not ruled by any net neutrality laws. They're able to tell people like um, Netflix and Hulu and all the rest to come and pay them to use their service. Now we come down to Nigeria. In Nigeria, a very good example actually is um, there was a time where the telecoms company wanted to actually ban Skype and WhatsApp. I don't know if any one of us remember this in 2013. They wanted to ban Skype and WhatsApp and all this um, um, what's OTT, we call them over the uh, top services. And so what they wanted to do was, they said they were losing a lot of money because WhatsApp was banning, um, was not allowing telecommunications again, making them make money to be making international calls. So definitely nowadays, I don't think anyone of us tops up to call internationally. We just go on WhatsApp and call. So this was making a lot of the telecoms company lose about trillions of naira actually then about 20 trillion naira and so what they decided to do was to say we're going to ban all the services on our um network and so people wouldn't have access again so let's just imagine if that had actually gone through so all of us now would still have to be paying and topping up our phones to be able to call internationally thank god that didn't go through so this is one of the advantages of net neutrality as um, my co -pan uh, panelists have discussed earlier so this argument keeps going back and forth um, between pro and um, against net neutrality. We then have the draft order. Okay, so another example I have here is um, in 2013. Okay, you now have Airtel. So what Airtel decided to do since they couldn't ban WhatsApp and Skype and others was they decided to collaborate. And I think it still goes on now. People on 9 Mobile too, you get like free internet or so to use Facebook and some other things for you to stream. So what they then decided to do was to collaborate and um, bring a promotion with WhatsApp and Facebook and some other um, social media services so that that way is to attract some customers to be able to use the Airtel um, broad, um, to use Airtel's um, service. Again, the consequence, it might seem, oh no, this is competition and whatnot, but the consequence of doing this is that people would then start using services like WhatsApp and um, Facebook, and will start ignoring the other messenger services that we have, for instance, Google Hangouts and Skype and others, because now Airtel is telling you with 1,000 Naira, you can, um, chat or call on limitedly or, um, on WhatsApp or on Facebook. So now we're already starting to have unfair competition in the industry. And this is one of the things that net neutrality aims to prohibit um, unfair competition. So in, um, as um, the debates kept going back and forth, the NCC then decided to publish the guidelines for the provision of internet service, which um, Ch um, Chika, I believe, um, spoke about earlier. So I wouldn't really delve into it too much. So the guidelines um, were to implement some net neutrality laws for ISPs and to protect the right of internet users to open internet, provide clear guidelines to ISPs on the use of traffic management practices, and for lawful content, application and services to prevent them from being blocked or made unavailable to some users. 
So that is where Nigeria stands at the moment. Again, this is still a draft and they're still seeking public opinion on what to do um, and when to implement it. As maybe time goes on and as this net neutrality debate is getting bigger and people are becoming more aware of what's going on, Nigeria will fully be able to implement it into law. At the moment, I think there are only about six as the last time I checked, there were only about six countries that actually had the laws, but there are about 50 of them that have like regulations or policies or rules for net neutrality in the world. And um, Korea, um, US, um, Russia, as Chika said earlier on, are some of the countries that actually have rules. EU as well, the UK, the US, they have rules. Um, and like I said, some states have even gone further to implement their own laws. So what do I think the future of net neutrality will be like? Generally, the world is embracing net neutrality. Like it's like I said earlier, it's getting more popular. We're talking more about it. And some people have decided to start implementing their laws, rules or guidelines towards net neutrality. And there's a general support towards it, even though we have people who are against it because they feel that the people, for instance, here, we have MTN who has invested about billions of dollars into their infrastructure in Nigeria and they want to recoup money from that. And one of the ways they can recoup money is to tell people like WhatsApp and Netflix and Hulu and co to at least share some of the costs because they are cutting them from um, the, some of their revenue like um for instance the international calls so for those companies telecoms companies definitely they are against net neutrality but for consumers because apart from the financial aspect it also um, decreases transparency where um it gets to the point that some of us would not have access or um some of our um searches will be slower to us or we can't even see some of the searches due to the restrictions that these telecoms have over our um, inter um, over our internet and what we can see. So, like I said, the world is embracing it. Several countries have already put so many things in place. Nigeria as well is seeking to conform with international best practices. Even though it's a draft at the moment, we're hoping that in the future we're going to adapt it into our laws. And um, as the NCC is seeking a lot of opinions now, we can definitely give our own opinions as lawyers to be able to assist. In the coming years, at least in the next five years, I hope that to see uh, more countries um, adopt it as well. Um, California and um, Vermont being one of the foremost ones, other states will start adopting it too. And hopefully the political parties, whether in Nigeria or in the US, do not hinder um, the advancement of net neutrality. So I think that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I think we have a question. One is asking, is net neutrality really practicable in this world? And if you know why, um, I think that question is for Mr. Suleiman. Hello, Mr. Suleiman. Okay, since Mr. Sumo is not online currently, um, Simi could answer that. Thank you. Okay, so do I think um, net neutrality is practical? Yes, it's practicable. Um, like I said, so there are already countries that are adopting it, about 40 something countries in the world that are adopting it already. Um, even though it's just even some of them, it might just be a debate for some, it might be just a rule or guideline. Um, yes. But again, um, there are risks involved with net neutrality, which um, Chika had spoken about earlier on. There are pros and cons. Definitely for the ISPs, it's not really a benefit for them because then they don't, they can't charge um, other the consumers or the other private ISPs for their services. The internet becomes open to everybody. Then even the government apart from maybe um, for um, for national security, they will not be able to restrict access to the internet as well for some things. So, um, so those are some of the reasons why some countries would definitely be against it. So definitely countries like definitely North Korea would definitely be against net neutrality because they don't want that. And then you find out that maybe more capitalist countries as well would be against net neutrality. 
but we'll see as it goes on if that would change but at the moment yes it's practicable and um hopefully more people will adopt it Okay, Mr. Solomon, you could say something. Okay. Uh, yes, so uh, so the question is, is net neutrality really practicable in the world? And if no, why? Now, um, to, to answer whether it is practicable, I would say yes. Is it possible? Sally, I would say no. You know, I've actually maintained this, and um, I, I can say this with all sense of conviction, that government is the biggest violator of people's privacy and personal data all over the world. Now, and you see, it, it, it is so clear. Now, I'm going to give you an example. So um, 2021, I was privileged to lead some consultants that worked on um, Nigeria's data protection bill, but not just only that, that was just a constituent of the project. So what we did is, was that we actually worked on a project advising European Investment Bank, World Bank, and French Agents for Development on the conditions Nigerian government needed to comply with in order to access funding for its digital identity project. Now, so why analyzing is data protection bill 2020, which is yet to actually be submitted to the National Assembly. Now, we made comparison because I, as a matter of fact, the funders, actually the development partners, they, they requested for us to, they, they requested us to analyze the bill and of course place it side by side with GDPR. Now, I, I will say this, national security, for example, is a legitimate concern any day, anytime, anywhere in the world. Now, first of all, we need to add the nation before we can talk about individual rights. That's right. But then, now, uh, the, the what we have seen in practice is that the, the, the uh, nations, governments, now find it easy to wake up someday when they wake up on the wrong side of the bed to, to I mean, th th that's talking about government officials. Now, to violate people's rights, all because uh, somebody somewhere, um, a, a, an ally, uh, a friend, complained of something and thought, I need to deal with that fellow. Now, I, I can tell you categorically, the provision of Section 35 of that bill, God forbid that bill becomes a law. Now, uh, the, the provision says, in case of data privacy, principle of data privacy, in case, sorry, in case of national security, principle of data privacy shall be exempted. It's outright, we, you can't even come to us and talk about privacy. Now, meanwhile, in, in GDPR, GDPR provision says, in cases of national security and some other you know, cases, principle of data privacy may be restricted subject to clear constitutional safeguards. You know what that means? Now, if NCC, for whatever reasons, needs to access personal data of some users, let's say in a place like Lagos, they need to approach the court, place an affidavit before the court, justify the reasons they need to actually access that. I'm gonna give you an example. Now, there's a particular case, which is um, Attorney General of New York, and um, Facebook. Now, Facebook, um, uh, Office of the AG of New York now uh, sent a warrant on Facebook to, to investigate 185 Facebook accounts. Now, Facebook declined, citing one. You cannot use one warrant, search warrant, to search 185 buildings if you were going to conduct that in a physical space. Now, and Facebook as an, uh, as, um, as an entity is a global landlord of such to all its numerous subscribers around the world. So we owe them a fiduciary duty and we need to comply with the law. So there's element of particularity that your process lacks. You need to go back and actually get one such warrant issued for 
each of the 185 Facebook accounts. Now, when you look at that, that is actually a safeguard that Facebook was forcing New York, you know, the government of New York to comply with. Now, so what we are saying is that if you look at such the provision of section 35 of data protection bill 2020, now if that bill becomes an act with that provision, my point and I retreat is that everything about data privacy or protection Nigeria will become a joke. Someday when the DG of SSS wakes up on the wrong side of the bed, you would write a letter to them, see, he can access as many personal data as he wants. All he needs to do is to cite national security. Meanwhile, in Europe, you cannot do that. The, the, the regulation says may be restricted, subject to clear constitutional safeguard. They must be safeguard. They have to be complied with. They cannot just be complied with. They must be seen to be complied with. So what we are saying here is that net neutrality is practicable. But is it really possible? I think it's, it's a question of uh, what we need to wait to see uh, beyond um, our hope and aspiration. Thank you. Um, Chika, would you like to add something to what Mr. Suleman has said? I think she's not on the call. Okay, we also have another question here. Can it be said that blocks are that then you could say something about it also? Sorry, can you come again? Said that blockchain is contradicting or supporting the principle of net neutrality. You get Question. Hello. Hello. Jessica, are you still there? Hello. Are you still there? I think you're muted. I can't hear you. So sorry about that. No problem. So the question is, can it be said that blockchain is contradicting or supporting the principle of net neutrality? That's a very, very, very good question. Okay. So we all know the way blockchain works and it, the way it works is that it's all about um, secrecy and um, preventing and being um, transparent and sorry, and being invincible. So the fact that you cannot track it, for instance, the Bitcoin and whatnot around blockchains. So um, yeah, I would say that blockchain is actually against um, net neutrality because the whole idea of net neutrality is for there to be transparency. And when we start having um, services or um, transactions which um, that are not visible to the rest of the people and which again cannot, we can't even have access to that to be able to regulate them because we don't know what's going on, the transfer of information, we don't know what's going on there basically, then it's not net neutrality, there's no transparency there. So blockchain is actually an adherence to net neutrality. Thank you so much. Mr. Suleiman, would you like to say anything about the question? Hello, Mr. Suleiman. Okay, I think he's not on the call, or I don't know, maybe the network. So there's also the last question here. Is there any provision in the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Act interacting with the principle of net neutrality? Is there any provision in the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Act interacting with the principle of net neutrality? Absolutely. Um, I think earlier on when I was talking about um, competition laws, especially 
where you have the um, Airtel example, for instance, where um, they were trying to uh, make money while at the same time you were trying to side cut other um, types of um, social media services or communication um, providers. So definitely the um, consumer protection laws definitely come in place with net neutrality because with net neutrality, it's going to avoid so many anti-competition um, policies and um, um, contracts that do go ahead. Um, I think um, another example in the US as well um, is, uh, oh, can I remember now? Okay, sorry, I can't remember. There was the one example that came into my head. I've lost it. But again, the Airtel one is a very good example, like I said. So um, it prevents all this anti-competition. So where one, okay, yes, I remember now, the AT&T, where they were not charging um, companies, where AT&T were charging other private ISPs from, um, they were charging them twice the amount that they would charge for their own internet to these private ISPs to provide to their own customers. Again, that is very unfair and it's unfair practices. So definitely the Nigerian um, law, um, com as competition law, it works hand in hand with net neutrality in that instance because again it allows for transparency it allows for fair um, competition it um, doesn't allow for monopoly of the market and other advantages thank you so much Simi. um so we're coming to the end of today's webinar i must say it's an interactive and profound section today. Thank you to our speakers for joining us today. Despite their busy schedule, I'm looking forward to seeing your subsequent webinar. A very big thank you to our sponsors, LLP African Law Practice, Farm View, J. Elias & Co., Avocat Law Practice, Everlaw Associates, DOA, and Blueprint for making this webinar possible today. Thank you also to our attendees for participating in today's webinar. Please do know that our next webinar series will be on Thursday by 1 p.m. and the topic is learning and development in the multi-generational workplace. Lastly, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch our past webinars and more webinars at My Years to Nigo. Thank you all for attending today's webinar and do enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, Ms. Simi so much and Mr. Solomon. You're welcome. Okay. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye.